The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Today I would like to offer a talk about, it's a Zen story, and many of you will know it from one perspective. However, recently I found a scroll, a picture of a scroll, and... Um, this scroll depicts the story in a, a different way. But let me first tell you the basis of the story, and then we'll do a little meditation and reflection on this picture. The basis of the story, as you can see, is a man has met a tiger on his path. I've sometimes given the story, the koan, what do you do when you meet a hungry tiger on a dark night? on a lonely path? Well, in this case, he has run. And he has run to the end of a cliff. And he has climbed over and found a vine to hang on to. And the vine looks a little precarious because above the vine there are two rats gnawing away at it, a white rat and a black rat. So far the story is fairly typical. Sometimes it's elephants that are chasing the man or other an animals. But it is uh, usually this person in a very distressed place hanging between something that is dangerous above or dangerous below. Often it's snakes below, and in this, and very often it's tigers. In this case, we have nagas, and I'll talk about the nagas. Something a little unusual in this picture is there is another element of distress with wasps flying around. And it is about what you do when you come to situations that seem impassable, seem impossible. What do we do to deal with this? In the uh, story that is more commonly known, there is one more element. Normally there is a strawberry, a tantalizing strawberry that is eye spot, a wild strawberry glowing, growing out of the cliff. And in this take on the story, he comes back to the present moment of how delightful, how wonderful and grabs the strawberry and eats it and delights before his pending death in this succulent taste of the strawberry. This I believe, when I saw this scroll, I believe the strawberry came later and I did a little research and found that the great scholar D.T. Suzuki when he first started to put out the Zen stories and create many books on the subject, that he added the strawberry in there because he thought the original context was too difficult for people to grasp and seemingly too painful. And it has actually become, the strawberry has become a hit because it's very, very broadly used and it works with the, um, the present mind meditation, mindful movements of practice. To be in the present and savor, even in difficult situations, what is useful and often quite sweet in life. But we will stay with this story. Now, for a few moments, I want you to just pause on this picture. Look at this picture, or you can take it into your mind if you want with your eyes closed. 
But you can look at this picture and I want you to just look at all the elements and everything that is happening and what it is about. What is it about for you? What it is telling you? We have a very powerful frightening image above a more doomful and just as fearful image below and here we are paused between the two wondering what to do there's a lot of space in this image there is a big pine tree. There is ocean. And waves. And there is this story about me. And what is precious to me. being life in this situation. There is a Jane story that's very similar, but it has a, a sword-wielding demoness at, at the top and hanging over the pit of snakes there is honey that's dropping from a beehive. So it's got elements here. Wild honey and how sweet the honey is. But here we have neither of those images, neither the strawberry nor the honey. But there is a pine tree. A beautiful pine. I will take you through my thoughts in our everyday life, in our everyday world. What arises in our mind th throughout the day. And remember, this is about time. Day and night, time ticking over, that's what the rats represent. Gnawing away every day in life, gnawing away as a conscious mind, our fears and anxieties and worries. Sometimes they're quite overwhelming. Sometimes life itself seems quite overwhelming. And quite often we find ourselves wanting to just run away, disappear. I've talked about the tiger as being very kind and I'll touch on that in a moment. The tiger is what we see in the mind is something that is very powerful. It is, has the capacity to devour a situation, completely consume it, absorb it, annihilate it. And what in our life is like that? What in our life, our everyday life, are we so hungry for, so needy for, so devouring. For children, youth these days, the computer games totally absorb. They devour your time, your mind. But in other ways, we all have patterns of thinking, both positive 
and not so positive in our life that are consuming us with worry, with concern. But here the tiger is less worried. He, is, he has a, a purpose. His purpose, of course, is to catch the object of prey. And we have this too. We are going for a job. We are trying to please our family, our partners. We are trying to become enlightened. We're meditating very hard. We've got it in our diary with the big letters at Chambramali's retreat. Nothing's going to get in the way of that. We have a holiday coming up. So we're feeding these influences, you might say, these quite strong influences of intention. And grasping, maybe less at this point in grasping, but at least in intention. The intention to take hold of, to gain, to establish a presence, a situation. Just for reflection, these are just something for you to reflect on what that is for you. Because it will give you an idea of when that is excessive, when that is out of proportion with many other parts of your life. There's a part of you that gets a little bit frightened, a little bit anxious. Because it's coming after you, it's, you know, it's wanting. It's Im pushing you forward. This is the tiger. The tiger, and I have said this poem before, once a, a, a Singapore master wrote a poem for me compared to a human's evil heart. A tiger is very kind. Even that thought, compared to what we can do as human beings, still the tiger is very kind. It can teach us something. And he goes into some part of this story that comes later, which is, if I can create something, just one thing in this case, if I can write the character of Tiger in one stroke, and he's a famous calligrapher, in that there is no good, no bad, no tiger, no human. There's not differentiation differentiations. If I can go deeply into one thing, this fear element disappears. And so what happens is there is a part of us that separates, that runs away, that hides. And this is where this fellow jumped off the cliff. In this case, I guess he's come down onto the pine tree or he's caught a, a vine as he's going down. The vine is where it's representing like everyday life, all the twists and the turns, the unexpected, the changes, the formations. But it, look, it's very thin. It looks like, you know, he could break under his weight. And above it, we have these black and white rats. These are so, all the indecisions, the time-wasting indecision. Will I or won't I? Is it right? Is it wrong? 
Have I got enough? Haven't I got enough? Do I need? Don't I? All this day-to-day indecision and confusion that we bring into our conscious thinking. It becomes like rats eating away, gnawing away, thoughts that gnaw away at at us. I'm not good enough. Oh, I did this. I should have done that. How we punish ourselves. How we disenfranchise ourselves with thoughts. And what they do is they weaken this thread of life that is so important that we're hanging on to every day. It weakens our capacity to hold on. And for many, especially young people who do not have a grasp of what their life is about, they let go. As we mature a little, you know, we learn to hold on. But here, you know, there's the added element. And we must remember he's holding on in space, this big mount of spaciousness, which life in this moment has a lot of spaciousness, has a lot of capacity to to do something, to act. He's threatened with these great big wasps, and the wasp nest up above is producing wasps. This is the, the stings that happened, the reminders. When we ignore something or we punish ourselves, we get this sense of being stung, being hurt a little. <laughs> the other day I was, uh, I was a little impatient. I was chopping some wood, trying to chop the last of this very hard wood I had from last year. It got very cold and I'm chopping the wood and chopped it in half but just carelessly didn't think where my hand was and the log as it split came down on my finger. And so I was punishing my finger for being in that place. (laughs) I looked at my finger and I thought, what are you doing there, you know? (laughs) You hurt yourself. So I'm tapping my finger and punishing my finger. Then when I went in to light the fire or add the log to the fire, I found the same hand touched the hot door. It's very interesting. Ah, double sting. (laughs) We do this to ourselves quite a lot. Life presents these little, not only challenges, but where we actually hurt (coughs) ourselves. The self-identification is so strong in us that even a little finger is a very painful part of who we are, if we do not take care, if we are not present. But here, in this case, he's looking down And there are two sea dragons. What are called nagas? And nagas are interesting because in Buddhism, depending on what part of of the culture, they they are either seen as a a great protector of the Dhamma. But in in the, the Pali Canon, they talk about the nagas always at war with another realm of beings called the the Garudas, I think they are. And they have little wings. They're like a sort of little angelic type of being. And the Nagas are always these powerful. You know, they have all the weapons. I have this protector painting at home, and people always come and say, what are those figures in the front? And they're all standing there with their weapons. I say, they're the Nagas who are protecting the Dharma. Because when the Dharma is removed from this world, then the Nagas hold it in their realm. But they have 
an aggressive part of them. And apparently, during the time of the Buddha, when the Buddha was uh, able to enter these realms, it is said that he actually, for a short time, got the Nagas and the, these Garudas to make peace with one another. But it didn't last. But here, in some cultures, they, they see them in this way. The Tibetans see them as um, an unfulfilled a dragon. They're not yet a dragon, which has got more holy and more a power. But here, these two Nagas, they're waiting for a meal at the other, the other end. They sit in the ocean. So what part of our mind is like a Naga? What part of our mind is, because a Naga is connected with the snake realm, is like a snake? In this case, they're in the oceans. The ocean, with its big waves, is uh, like our consciousness, our subconsciousness. It's the big depth of our mind, the big subconscious capacity to hold everything that we have ever done. The seeds of all our past karma and all our potential is all held within this great ocean of being. We call it the great samadhi ocean. And when we enter in meditation, we enter down into this place and we can see the movements of mind. We can see these deep dark nagas the deep subconscious traits. So this, this fellow is not wanting to go deep into who he is. He doesn't want to look at these unwholesome influences. And I think that is like most of us. Many of us are treading the path to some degree or another, but still we're hanging on to certain habitual patterns and habits and thought processes that bind us to quite um, powerful forces, you might say, within us that in, in force us to behave in certain ways that we may not be conscious of, we may not have control of. There's very deep fluctuations of mind. Subconscious mind influence our everyday, which you might say the channels of behavior, everyday deep habits of behavior that we all come to know and oh that's just how my brother thinks and that's what he does and we accept it. And we don't really think very much about it. But it's a very important place because here it's looking like it's going to consume him. Let's just come back here. And we've got this pine tree, which I didn't isolate. And the pine tree is sort of holding everything together. The roots of the pine are into the earth. The top of the pine is up above the ground that the tiger is standing on. And when I asked two young lads who came to visit recently, what would you do in this situation? One said, well, you climb up the rope. You get onto the pine tree. And the younger one said, well, why doesn't he just swing? <laughs> Jump onto the, onto the cliff. <laughs> the children's minds are very fresh, you know, they see things instantly. Why doesn't he just climb up? Why doesn't he just do it? Why doesn't he just act? Why is he sitting there worrying about what to do? Why is he worrying about, why is he getting bitten and staying in that situation? A young mind is very interesting. Get out. 
That's no fun. <laughs> Climb up. <laughs> and we tend to sort of hang in there and just accept it as, well, this is life. This is my, <laughs> what I've been dealt. But there's something deeper in here. If you look at all of these, they all are within this picture. The space, the ocean, the pine. And a pine tree is seen in Buddhism. It is a great um, wisdom. It is seen as a great wisdom, as a very wise entity because the pine has been there a thousand years. In my nun teacher's temple, the old pine is 500 years, so halfway there. It has seen generations and lives of people come and go. It has seen wars, it's seen destruction, it's seen famine, it's seen natural disaster. And still it proudly stands above all of that. So the pine is seen as a, a great wisdom. A poem here says, Not yet a Buddha, this ancient pine is dreaming, still dreaming, by Issa. Issa was a great um, haiku poet. Just not still not yet there. Even though he's a great pine, a proud and tall and aged pine, he is still dreaming. Down the village, the chimes of the flutes and drum, here in the mountain everywhere, the sound of the pines. When the wind blows through the pines, the sound is very refined, it's very beautiful. I lived above a forest of um, cypress pine and it's like music coming through the pine, through the forest. I only have one pine tree on my property now, but even the eucalyptus, when the winds come through, it's quite a beautiful sound. If you are present enough to hear it, is he present enough to hear it? Did you know that at the edge of the deep valley there is an excellent pine tree growing upright in spite of many years of cold by Kazan? He's talking about a great master. Great masters are often said to be great pines. My temple in, in Korea is called Vast Pines. It means that there have been many great practitioners and great masters in this temple over the centuries. Vast Pines. On the Buddha, on the morning, the dawn of his waking, the full moon, the moon was full before the sun rose, his Arthur's long search would end and the poet Jane Hurstfield says he sat down under the Bodhi tree in this case we bring the Bodhi into it in the shelter of the natural world in all its beauty and fullness and he said I will not move from this place until I have solve, solved my problem I will not move from this place until I have overcome this was the Buddha's resolve overcome my illusions my delusions my Mara maybe this is what he's thinking I don't know will I stay here until I can overcome all this suffering all this delusion Recently, I was holding up a pole in the other way, holding it up, 
with a banner on it. Protect the unburnt at a, at a, um, it was a, a, a rally in the city at Parliament House. Inside you have the decision makers. Outside there was a crowd, quite a large crowd of people. Actually they were mostly, they had people singing in a little choir and it was <laughs> a very sort of kind demonstration in a way. But it was to protect the unburnt, to protect what we haven't already destroyed, or already hurt, already cut down and removed. How do we protect that? They found a clause in uh, the original document in relationship to this legislation created in the Kennett government, which was about giving a very large amount of timber to Japan for pulp, for wood chip. And the clause was re in regard if there is a very serious bushfire, then they could annul this agreement. But the, uh, and even with this very serious bushfire, I mean, what happened was they started to log a lot more. And so I saw at this demonstration where they had a, a very big picture that was passed around with all the logging coops, which really you can see how much devastation they're adding to what has already happened with devastation. And can we just say it is out there? It is governments. This is the tiger. This is what is also within our concern our conscious reality of you may not have a political view on this, you may not be involved, but everybody is involved on some level with something that is of a great deep concern for you. We have an issue that is to do at the moment with the protection of children. We're having to try and educate this concern in various religious con communities. Or another one which is around um, the prevention of abuse. These are all uh, quite large, quite overwhelming issues that are currently present. Have always been there to some degree, but they have in recent times, and we saw in recent times where in the news where a family was burnt from family violence, abuse of another human, a hurting of ourselves and another. This all falls into this story. Because this story, every element in this story is some part of myself. That tiger is some part of myself, the way I think about my world. my concerns for the environment or for the ecology or climate or concerns about human tragedy, human abuse, substance, detention. We all have this as part of what's going on around us today. And this becomes a devouring a powerful, a fearful thing that we cannot turn away from. It may be less so in our family, in our life. We may actually be living quite a wholesome and happy life, have a good job, have a wonderful family, but it is there still. And we often just turn away 
run away, ignore. But we are humans. Just like we are all sitting in this room together, we are human. And humans have a great capacity to heal and to help overcome other human suffering, including our own. So here we have all the elements that offer a picture On some level, we're all hanging by the thread. <laughs> Will I have my job tomorrow? Will I have enough money to pay the bill, the everyday thread? Is my health okay? And then on another level, we have on a deep subconscious level those drives and those passions those loves and those hates that have ingrained in families and generations and cultures that make us either drive us to want to act or they make us actually numb. And we don't do anything. We fall down into their, into their place very easily. But this always offers the point of wisdom. In this picture, wisdom is always there. It is a story. And there is another element in this, a very something you may not have seen. See on that vine, there is autumn colors. It is talking about impending aging. It has another element of Time is passing, we're aging, and life is slipping by. So here we are, we are always grappling with these things. But what one thing we can do, and what he does, and I think that's what's represented back in that strawberry aspect of it and perhaps why this was a popular version. We have the capacity to go in and experience all of this within ourselves. We have the capacity to enter into this moment, this moment of pain this moment of deep streamed cultural acceptance and delusion and feel what that's about. This moment of our fears and our anxieties about future. Because we have the capacity when we go deeply within that this deep, fundamental, innate wisdom will arise and compassion in our heart will open our heart to respond in an appropriate way. We all have that. When we are deeply still, we connect. You know from meditation when you sit and you center into this moment. The strawberry is about connection, sweet connection, liberation, peaceful liberation. Another thing is that, uh, you know, these situations offer us through this reflection to deeply recognize what virtues, what positive inclinations, positive habits we can feed. Coming back to feeding the tiger, on a deeper level we can feed 
this mind with kindness, this tiger with kindness, this anger with kindness, this situation that seems impossible and beyond any of us with more kindness. The kindness of the tiger. Hmm. Dogen once wrote, I beseech you, noble friends, learn through experience. Do not become so accustomed to this, the images, the outer forms. that you are dismayed by the true dragon, that you become disillusioned and dismayed by what we think is inevitable or impossible. Because that possibility is something we can act upon, we can do something about. We can help another. It's only a little act and a little act and a little act. It's only a kind thought that leads to a kind action. The true dragon is so much bigger than any of those images in and of themselves. It is the power of it all. If we separate anyone, anything there, then our life doesn't have any meaning. If we take away the, drag, the tiger, we have no power. We feel powerless. If we take away the thread in life, daily life, then what is daily life? You know, we're just waking up to go to sleep at night. If we take away some of the aspects that seem a little painful, then we never, we never really feel. We never develop empathy and compassion for the pain of others. And we don't understand suffering. It is only when we really go to the depth of this so-called Naga realm, this deep, deep subconscious mind through meditation that we can steal all those deep forces that drive us in unwholesome ways. And then we can protect the Dharma. Then we can actually do something that is both creative and powerful and virtuous so we can see these all a part of my mind. The wisdom element is always there. The space is always there. That human capacity to make decision is always there. We always have a choice to climb up, to move. Hmm. So always remember that is very important. I like the sort of the top to bottom and bottom to top approach of looking at this. When I first, you know, went straight down the middle, didn't even notice the pine. And then I slowly went into the picture, contemplating, contemplating. So I hope you can you know, hold this image for a little bit and reflect on it. Reflect on what these different images mean and beyond the image what they are in your real life like we have to look at it from a real life perspective what has been painful today and what has been you know powerful and wondrous and connecting this this life chain in the middle this daily life chain what we're doing now is reflecting what we're 
do tomorrow. This karmic connection, the karmic links, never flows in the way we think, but it is there. So reflect on these images. You need a little bit of sweetness, reflect on the strawberry and what that means. <laughs>